This is a CBC Podcast. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Phelan Johnson. With the holidays just around the corner and cold weather kicking in, now is a good time to curl up with a great book and escape. From works of fiction that feel so real to universes full of superheroes and mutants, this week we're creating your holiday book list. This is something that I've said a lot in the context of writing is that something need not be factual to be true. I think people are looking for hope and they can find that in post-apocalyptic stories. As a fan of of X-Men and this universe, it was so cool to contribute and also to contribute a new Native mutant. Today on the show, Indigenous authors who wrote some of the hottest books of the year and their picks to add to your reading list. Anishinaabe author Wabgijik Rice is in the perfect position to recommend books this year. He was on the jury for this year's Writers' Trust Award for Fiction, and he had to read 123 books by Canadian authors in seven months. Wab is a former journalist and the author of the award-winning novel Moon of the Crusted Snow. Though it came out in 2018, the post-apocalyptic novel is still resonating with readers. Originally from Wasoxing First Nation near Perry Sound, Ontario, Wab lives in Sudbury with his wife and two young boys. Welcome back to the show, Wab. Thank you very much, Fallon. Happy to be here. So we're going to talk about your book pick in a few minutes. But first, you've been very busy during this pandemic. You left your job at CBC and have transitioned to writing full time. Uh, In January, you will begin writing the highly anticipated sequel to Moon of the Crusted Snow. What's it like writing a book about a dystopian world during a pandemic? (laughs) <laughs> it's uh, very weird. It has sort of made me take a step back and sort of reassess my, I guess, plan for the book uh, in, in not a major overhaul kind of way, just sort of taking a look at some of the minor elements of, you know, dystopia and the end of the world. And, you know, this world that I created with Moon of the Crested Snow, I have to sort of pick it back up. And my plan is to write about the post-apocalypse 10 years after the end of Moon of the Crescent Snow, right? So I have to imagine what's going to be left of the world, what exactly led to the demise of civilization. And I guess the, the biggest challenge is trying to imagine the details of everyday life that are going to exist, you know, 10, 12 years after the end of the world and what exactly prompted that end too, you know? So, you know, I was originally thinking that there'd be a sickness slash plague element to it, but now I'm sort of <laughs> reconsidering how that's going to work, right? Because, you know, in that sense, I have to sort of balance speculation with reality now that we are actually living through a plague. It's been kind of weird, but it's been good, too, because, you know, for the first time in my life, I can focus full time on my imagination and writing these stories. So I feel very fortunate. I feel very privileged to be able to do this right now. And so what can readers expect with the new book? Well, uh, they can expect uh, a world, uh, I guess, in the aftermath of the blackout that happened in Moon of the Crested Snow. And they'll experience the world through the eyes of the community once again. And what the community members are going to be doing, there's going to be about five or six of them who are on a quest to see what's left of the world. So they're going to travel south in hopes of reclaiming their spot uh, on Georgian Bay, where which is their original homeland, this community, right? Because in Moon of the Crest and Snow, you learn that this community of Nishnabek was originally displaced from the south to the far north. So uh, they're on this quest to see what's left of the world and what's left of their original homeland. So um They'll, I guess, find out what happens to these characters and how the new generation of the community grows up, you know, in this new era. And uh, that's a real fun thing to imagine, too, for sure. Mm -hmm. So since the beginning of the pandemic, interest in Moon of the Crested Snow has picked up again. Why do you think that's the case? Uh, I think that's due to a number of reasons. Firstly, people have more time to read. You know, Mm -hmm. they're at home a lot. And I think they're looking for, you know, interesting stories to pass the time. And, you know, it's a huge honor for me to have another bump uh, for my book, you know. But I think there's an added appetite to read post-apocalyptic or dystopian stories because we are living through this end of the world. And I think people want to read a resolution. 
in any sort of post-apocalyptic story, there's always an end to what's going on. And, and it's not always a happy ending, but there is some finality there. And, and right now, we sort of have an idea of how this is all going to end because, you know, there's discussions about vaccines that are going to be out soon. But it's still very mysterious, right? And that's what happened in the first months of the pandemic. You know, we just didn't know what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think reading a book about an end of the world still provides some sort of ending, right? Some sort of resolution. And and in a book like Moon of the Crested Snow, despite, you know, the trauma of a world ending and the tragedies that accompany it, there is an underlying spirit of hope in that story, in that, you know, the community um, looks to the future and sees it as an opportunity for renewal. And I think people are looking for hope and, and they can find that in post-apocalyptic stories. So as I mentioned, in addition to writing, you've been reading a lot this year, uh, being on the jury for the Writers' Trust Awards for Fiction. You read 123 books by Canadian authors in seven months. So how did you manage to do that? <laughs> it's a lot of reading for sure. And I definitely would not have been able to do it if I hadn't left CBC. The opportunity first arose in the winter. I was approached by the Writers' Trust to see if I would uh, take on this uh, task. And I was really interested. And at that time, I had a pretty good idea that I was going to be moving on from my job at Up North uh, at CBC Radio and focusing primarily on, on fiction. So, you know, I was like, OK, I will have time later on this year to do the bulk of this reading if, if I need to. Right. So if I didn't, though, I definitely wouldn't have been able to, to take that on, because, as you know, hosting a radio show is a lot of work. And my previous job as host of Up North, you know, was pretty long days. And, and you know, you're committed to a community in a region and you're pretty much on all the time. At the same time, our, our second son was born in June, too. So I was like, well, I'm definitely going to need to free up some time for reading <laughs> in that sense at, at the same time, right? So yeah, it was just a matter of looking ahead and strategizing. But I was able to serve on that jury with two brilliant uh, fellow authors, uh, Elizabeth Demiriathi and Yasuko Tan. And we just had these monthly discussions that were really enriching, um, really uh, fulfilling and empowering in many ways, too. And we're mostly on the same page as to what we wanted in terms of a shortlist. And um, mm -hmm. so it was a pretty um, efficient process in that sense, too, because, you know, we read through the stories, we shared what we liked about them. And um, I think we were able to close in on a shortlist. Mm hmm. So five finalists were chosen, and two of them were by Indigenous authors, Five Little Indians by Michelle Good and Indians on Vacation by Thomas King. So year over year, we're seeing more attention being paid to Indigenous authors, uh, many of whom have, you know, had best-selling books. How does that make you feel? And, and, you know, what does that tell you about the Canadian literary landscape? <sighs> Oh, well, it's really inspiring. And it's, again, really empowering to see these works by Indigenous authors, uh, you know, climb up bestseller lists, uh, make it onto the short list for major prizes. I think that's due to a lot of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, you know, we have the stories in us and we have the skills and capabilities to effectively relay them in books, right? Like we are literary people in that sense, even though many of us come from uh, oral backgrounds, you know, we have the power to translate that into the written word. And I think that's really encouraging for readers and writers alike to, to know that, right? To know that we are part of this big movement of, you know, solidifying our place in the literary landscape and, and really um, pushing back against the narrative of Canada that I think kept us out of the literary realm for a really long time. For me, I'm just honored to be a part of it. And, you know, to have uh, both Five Little Indians and Little and Indians on Vacation make it onto the shortlist was a very organic thing. You know, uh, for me, obviously, I, I gravitated towards those stories as an Indigenous person, you know, both as a reader and a writer. But uh, Elizabeth and Yasuko found value and I guess the spirit in those stories as well to make them worthy of the shortlist at the same time, you know, um, from a literary perspective, they were solid, you know, they deserve to be on the shortlist. And I think they came from really good places from two very brilliant people who know how to share stories and who are passionate about their people and their culture. And, and that comes through in sort of the literary format. Yeah, you weren't slipping 20s to the other jurors. Then. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, Wob, I know this is a hard question to ask a writer. Um, you know, you know a lot of other writers. You're friends with a lot of other writers. But, you know, we are trying to build our holiday book list. So whose book would you recommend we put on it this year? Well... 
I guess I should probably go back to that short list because, you know, m- the main objective of my year was to read all these books and to champion a core list of five of them. And two of them happen to be by Indigenous authors, as you mentioned, right? Um, So Thomas has, you know, been around for a long time. He is an icon in storytelling. And uh, he, you know, has been on CBC Radio a lot. You know, fans will know Dead Dog Cafe Mm -hmm. and so on. So he's had his time to talk on CBC. So I will (laughs) take this opportunity to uh, champion Michelle, uh, Michelle Good. And I had the opportunity over the summer to interview her for a couple of literary events about Five Little Indians. And her her story, both the story itself and her story in becoming an author are just so compelling. And I think for your unreserved listeners, um, they'd be really keen to hear about how she became an author and how this book came together. So Five Little Indians, in a quick nutshell, is a book about five residential school survivors, and it follows them in the years after their release, I guess you could say, from residential school, and how the trauma of that experience follows them through the rest of their lives, specifically uh, living in an urban center like Vancouver, right? So the era it covers is sort of like the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I think those are crucial moments, especially for people who survived residential schools when it wasn't part of the Canadian psyche, right? There was just no, really no awareness back then. Mm -hmm. So they were left to survive it on their own and with each other. Uh, So it's a really intimate look at how these five lives sort of intertwine and how they uh, support each other on a path to healing. And I think in fiction, it provides an opportunity to really broaden that scope. So in nonfiction and memoir, there is a canon already of Indigenous literature about the residential school experience, but there isn't a whole lot of fiction yet. And I think Michelle just really hit it out of the park with Five Little Indians because it it really broadens that perspective and it provides that nuance and that deeper context that I think um, we all really need to read, you know, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people alike. And, you know, she became a published author in her 60s. This is her debut novel. And already mm-hmm. it was critically acclaimed, you know. So, yeah, I think uh, I would say Five Little Indians by Michelle Good. All right. Well, I'm going to add it to my list. Thanks for taking the time today, Wob. Oh, thanks a lot for having me, Fallon. Always great to chat with my unreserved friends. Uh, keep up the great work and uh, we'll chat again soon, I'm sure. Wab Gishik Rice is an award-winning Anishinaabe author and journalist. His upcoming novel, a sequel to his best-selling novel, Moon of the Crusted Snow, will be published in 2022. Moon of the Crusted Snow is also being developed as a six-episode TV series. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and NATO Voice 1. I'm Phelan Johnson. A few minutes ago, author Wab Gishik Rice chose Five Little Indians as a book you should add to your holiday reading list. It's a powerful work of fiction that follows the lives of five residential school survivors. As children, they tried their best to stick together. As young adults, the characters chart difficult paths filled with heartache and hope. It's a story that first-time novelist Michelle Good labored over for nine years. But it was a story she had to tell. Her effort paid off. The manuscript won HarperCollins and University of British Columbia's Best New Fiction Prize and paved the way to publication. And this year, Five Little Indians was long-listed for the Giller Prize and shortlisted for the Rogers Writers' Trust Award. Good as Nehiel Plains Cree and originally from Red Pheasant Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. Today, she lives in Chase, B.C. Congratulations on all the success, Michelle, and welcome to Unreserved. Well, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. So, as I mentioned, you've worked on this, your first book, for nine years you know, how does it feel to have it shortlisted for the Rogers Writers Trust Award and longlisted for the Giller Prize? Well, you know, it's really quite surreal and certainly was not in my mind when I was writing this or even when we were going through the editing process and when it was released. But it's it's incredibly satisfying, not because of the awards themselves, but because of the the trajectory that they put the book on and the invitation that it amounts to, that it's broadened to a, a, you know, a wider reader base, which of course is my overall objective. But I think the most satisfying really is the reader responses that I get. People track me down on my website and send me messages about their reading experience with the book. And it's very, very touching some of the things that people have said So why did you want to tell a fictionalized version of the residential school experience and its aftermath? 
Well, a couple of reasons. One is that I think fiction gives the writer a broader freedom in terms of how you characterize your characters. You're not limited by facts, you're limited by ideas. And there is really no limit to the ideas about the impacts of these schools. The other reason that I chose fiction is that I think a lot of people find fiction safe. And while it can be an extremely powerful experience to read something like this, you know, a reader can approach it and say, well, you know, it's just fiction until they find their way into it. And then the truth of it hits them, so to speak. The, mm -hmm. the truth of it takes over the fictional aspect. And this is something that I've said a lot in the context of writing is that something need not be factual to be true. And sometimes what we find in, in fiction is overwhelmingly the truth, if not specifically factual. Mm. And so nine years is a long time to spend working on a book, you know, but especially considering the darkness of the subject matter, you know, in this one. So what was it like for you to live with these characters and with this story for so long? Well, you know, these characters took on a life of their own very early on, and they became living people in my world. In a way, they became like my own children. And in many ways throughout, I often felt as though I was a scribe for the characters, as opposed to a creator of the characters. You know, and now that festival season is winding down and so on, I'm starting to miss them as I move into my next project. <laughs> like, I love them, right? They're, you know, I do feel in many ways that they're like my children. But nine years is a very long time, but it took that long to get it right. And I wasn't in any hurry. I needed it to to strike the right tone. Mm -hmm. And so you aren't a residential school survivor yourself, but you do feel a connection to residential school survivors. Can you tell me a bit about that? Well, I'm not a, a survivor of residential school, but I am a survivor of the foster care system. And when I was aging out of foster care at 18, that was right around the time that these characters were aging out of the residential school. And so I remember that Vancouver very well. That's where I was living. And I remember experiencing some of the challenges that the characters experienced as well in terms of trying to find your way with no support, with no resources, with basically nothing. Um, you had a nickel in your pocket, that was it. You turn 18, you're out, that's all. But in addition to that, you know, I started working with Indigenous organizations when I was 18. And basically everybody in those days was a survivor of residential school. So my entire cohort were survivors. And though it was not often spoken of explicitly, it was there in the reality of our relationship. And then, of course, my mother, my grandmother, my aunties, uncles, cousins are all survivors of residential school. So it was not something I had to learn about. It was something that was an integral part of my life. So I know that your mom has a presence in the book. Um, can you tell me a bit about about her in the book? There is a character in the book, um, Clara, whose best friend, Lily, dies. She hemorrhages to death from tuberculosis. And that is something that happened to my mother. Her friend, Lily, and her name was Lily, hemorrhaged to death on the playground at the residential school that my mother attended with the children all standing around watching this. And that was a very difficult part to write uh, from the book because I remember my mother telling me about that and telling me about it in such a matter of fact way, as though it was just, you know, a part of life, something that happens without outrage or any other response than basically passing on some history to me. The other part about that is a direct reflection on things that my mother shared with me. At one point, the grimy motel manager where the girls are working makes a terrible statement to them and says, you know, you Indian chicks, you're only good for two things, and they both happen in motel rooms. That's an extrapolation of something that the principal of my mother's residential school said to her. She was 11 years old. She had been given a, a piece of food that had been contaminated by a cat, and she refused to eat it. 
and she was made to sit for hour upon hour upon hour in the in the dining room and she still would need it my mother was a force of nature they apparently mm-hmm. didn't know that at the time she mm-hmm. was dragged into the principal's office and told that she was nothing but a no good indian slut and would never be anything but a no good indian slut she was 11 years old and so that concept of indigenous women which has played such an important role in the devastation of the lives of indigenous women is reflected in my mother's story and is reflected in the novel in that way why do you think five little indians has resonated with readers and with critics well i i give that to my characters i i think what i was saying earlier about how i felt like a scribe I think that there is an authenticity to these characters that comes from the authenticity of my experience with survivors. Especially again I say reading reader reviews, they come to love these characters to experience them as real people, you know, rather than being archetypes or pawns on a chessboard or, you know, that kind of thing. I think they resonate with a real humanity. I think that's why people are responding the way they are. Do you think that works of fiction like Five Little Indians can play a part in helping Canadians grapple with the history of residential schools? Absolutely. You know, truth is truth. No matter what platform you find for it, it's truth. And people respond to to the truth, whether they intellectually understand that, that this is a truth in the form of fiction, they respond viscerally when that truth hits them. And I think that's what this book has been able to do. And I love these characters. They're like my kids. <laughs> <laughs> so we're asking guests on the show today to pick a, a new book by an Indigenous author that we can add to our holiday book list. Uh, what book would you like to add to our list? Well, you know, I don't particularly recognize the American border. I really wanted to, you know, delve into Canlit, and I have. But my my favorite book by an Indigenous author this year is The Night Watchman by mm-hmm. Louise Hedrick, who is one of my favorite authors of all time. Um, her writing is so complex and so simple at the same time. And uh, it's a beautiful addition to her significant uh, library. <laughs> <laughs> and so what is it about uh, what is it about The Night Watchman that you like so much? Well, Louise Erdrich is uh, somebody referred to my book in a blurb as being uh, a masterpiece of braided narrative. Louise Erdrich is the queen of braided narrative. She can bring in 15 characters in a book and make it work so that you don't think they're all the same. And and it's that that draws me to her writing all the time. It's uh, the braided narrative and the way she characterizes and the way she brings history into the modern day so that we have that that continuity of, you know, where her story starts and where it's come to. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, yeah, thank you. Michelle Good's first novel, Five Little Indians, was long listed for this year's Giller Prize and shortlisted for the Rogers Writers Trust Award. She is currently working on her second novel. We spoke to her from her home in Chase, B.C. If you want a list of all the books we're talking about on the show today, head to our website, cbc.ca slash unreserved. Coming up, we'll hear from Darcy Little Badger, author of A Lats Away, a new young adult fantasy book. Little Badger was inspired to have a Lippin Apache character in her book because growing up, she didn't see much of her culture in the books she read. I would read hundreds of books. I, I was just this this quiet, kind of shy kid. I, I After sixth grade, I didn't really have any friends until college. But books provided this just beautiful escape for me, this way just to you know let go of all the problems of the world and be happy. And yet I never read about another Lippin Apache character. That's coming up. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Phelan Johnson. Today on the show, we're talking to authors and building a holiday book list. Our next book, a graphic novel called If I Go Missing, was inspired by a letter. Asking for the public's help 16 days after an Indigenous girl goes missing is equivalent to announcing publicly her life does not matter, or at least not as much as others. It teaches the boys and men who discard girls in rivers, 
beat them in back lanes, and drug them at parties that Indigenous girls' lives don't matter. They won't be missed, and no one will look for them. It teaches me my life does not matter. My name is Brianna Johnny, and I am Ojibwe. When I was 14, I wrote a letter to the chief of police, as well as a few other members in places of power in the city. And basically, that letter was about how I felt regarding the missing and murdered Indigenous women, not only in my community, but across Canada. It kind of went viral of sorts. And I was getting a whole lot of, you know, feedback on it, not only from those who I'd sent the letter to, but from my community, as well as the media and people who have actually had uh, family members who had gone missing. And I think at that point, because I was only 14, it was it was really scary for something that I had written to be on display for the world to see. It was something that I knew held a lot of power in it and I knew that because I had been given this chance of you know having my voice been in the light that there was a lot of things that I could do from that to try and bring more awareness to the issue. With the book happening actually I was approached by the publisher um about the story and actually asked if you know that would be something that I had wanted to do was to you know turn the letter into the book and you know bring it to to youth to try and display this message that I was trying to convey to the younger generation who um I always thought was like really important to connect with and it's given me a lot of really awesome opportunities to talk with people who are passionate about the same issues as me and to bring more awareness. Because the issue is super serious and is, you know, it's, it's hard to talk about sometimes. I wanted it to be able to be accessible to the younger generations and to be able to have an environment where they're able to learn about um, the important issues that are going on in their community, but in a way that wasn't hard for them to understand you know when I was right like when the whole project was going through I really just wanted it to be something that brought more awareness to it and whether or not if it has changed even one person and how they've thought about the subject before or even brought more awareness to it that's always been the goal that I wanted the book to have That was Brianna Johnny talking about her graphic novel, If I Go Missing. It was inspired by a letter she wrote to the Winnipeg police and members of local government. That letter also inspired a documentary also called If I Go Missing. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Phelan Johnson. Darcy Little Badger is Lipin Apache and is an Earth scientist. She is also a prolific writer and has written a long list of horror and speculative fiction short stories. In August, she released her first novel, Alatsaway, and it is receiving critical acclaim, including being featured in Time Magazine's list of best fantasy books of all time. She joins me from California. Welcome to the show, Darcy. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. So your first novel, Alatsue, what's it about? It's a young adult fantasy mystery, and it takes place in a world that's very similar to ours, uh, with a few exceptions. For example, there's things like fairy rings, there's curses, magic, and monsters. And the main character, Ellie, who is a lip on Apache like me, She has this ability to raise the ghosts of animals, Um, only animals, but that includes all animals, including prehistoric ones like woolly mammoths and trilobites. So her cousin is murdered, and unfortunately, the authorities assume that his death is an accident. It's certainly staged to look like a car accident, but Ellie knows that this doctor named Abe Allerton killed him. Unfortunately, she doesn't know why or how that happened. So this book is really her, with the help of her uh, family and her friends, and her ghost dog, Kirby, investigating this murder in this very creepy South Texas town uh, named Willoughby. 
<laughs> yeah, I th- that's uh, uh, Kirby. I am. Uh, I'm really excited to read the book because I am excited to uh, to see about this Kirby character. So, w- why was this a story you wanted to tell, and particularly to a young adult or YA audience? Yeah, it, it really started when I was a teenager. I just wanted to write this ghost story about a house haunted by the ghost of a parrot. Uh, because I thought it would be cool if this ghost kind of resembled a person. At first it could talk, and then it became evident that it was a bird. And from there, I just started thinking about all the really interesting ways that animal ghosts might be able to have supernatural powers that are different than, for example, human ghosts. Uh, so at, at its core, Alatsui kind of sprung up from that that seed of imagination. And, oh, wouldn't it be cool if mosquito ghosts could bite a person and then fly around with little droplets of blood? So it'd be like an invisible mosquitoes with a red mist in the air. But Alatsui itself is a story, really the, the most important part of it is Ellie's attempt to find justice in this, this world that's stacked against her. And the strength that she derives from her family and from the knowledge that has been passed down through the generations of the women in her family from her sixth great grandmother and the way that this kind of empowers her uh, to take down this, this powerful, wealthy individual. That's something that I think is important really right now for anyone, but especially for young adults. And uh, one thing about Ellie is she is a teenager So that even adds these barriers, for example, people might not take her as seriously as an adult. Um, So I I hope that the young adult audience who reads it, like, first of all, enjoys the story, because I remember how important books were when I was a teenager, especially fantasy and science fiction books. So I thought it would be really cool just to, to write something that's hopefully entertaining, but also these themes of perseverance and stuff, I, I think, help somebody. So the main character, Alatsue or Ellie, is Lipin Apache. So why was it important for you to tell these stories that highlight your culture? Yeah, uh, we're so there's actually many different types of Apache people. And that's something that not everyone knows. Uh, in fact, uh, there, there are uh, some people who think that Native Americans, you know, in the U.S., that it's just this one uh, monoculture. And, and that's not actually true uh, because there's hundreds of different nations and tribes just in this country. And then, of course, if you look at indigenous peoples across North America, that expands. But even within, you know, Apache peoples, Lipan Apache are unique. For example, in a lot of way, a, a lot of the story deals with the way that we conceive of the underworld and our, our perception of ghosts, which is, again, very Lipan unique. Growing up, I, I would read hundreds of books. I, I was just this this quiet, kind of shy kid. I, I After sixth grade, I didn't really have any friends until college. But books provided this just beautiful escape for me, this way just to you know let go of all the problems of the world and be happy. And yet I never read about another Lip on Apache character. And it's the kind of thing where every person is many different things. Like I'm a woman, I'm a scientist, I'm also Lip on Apache. And yet when one one component of your identity is, you know, never represented, especially uh, when you're growing up, that can be very discouraging. So I, I did think it was important to write a fantasy story that has a character who shares my culture. It, it's been cool. I've, I've actually uh, done interviews with other Lipon people and I've, I've heard from readers who are Lipon who are like, this is a really great book. And, and that's that's really everything to me. So Time Magazine named it as one of the best 100 fantasy books of all time. How does that feel? (laughs) It was, uh, at first, I I didn't quite believe it. Uh, I had to double check with my editor and other people to make sure that it wasn't somebody, uh, you know, making a mistake accidentally thinking I was on that list. Uh, but but once the shock wore off, <laughs> I got I gotta say it, it's it's really uh, it's wonderful because my book has just been out a couple of months and the positive support that it's received in that amount of time uh, ha- has really blown me away and it's made this a great debut experience uh, and it, it's it's so cool to to see a Latsue in like these magazines but it's also like cool to see photographs from from readers who take pictures of the book next to like their dog. Uh, I've gotten several (laughs) of those and I love them. (laughs) 
And so you're a part of an artistic movement called uh, Indigenous Futurism, and it's science fiction and fantasy, uh, and it's populated with characters and themes from Indigenous cultures. So why why do you think this genre is taking hold? Uh, yes. And one thing I really love about Indigenous Futurisms is its emphasis on the continuity of our cultures. Because oftentimes when you look for Native characters, like especially Apache characters in, in fiction, they're really relegated to Westerns or to historical type, you know, fantasies. But in Indigenous Futurisms, there is this emphasis that we are not only, you know, peoples where our cultures existed in the past, uh, but we're also peoples of the present. You know, we're currently surviving and thriving and in the future, we'll continue to do so. Uh, and just the way that throughout time, um, you know, the, this chain of like ancestors influencing the current generations would then influence future generations, I think is really cool. Uh, it's also very hopeful. It, it kind of combats this narrative that we all died out <laughs> during colonialism. <laughs> yeah, for sure. In addition to your new novel, you also wrote a storyline for Danny Moonstar, a.k.a. Mirage, the Northern Cheyenne mutant superhero from the X-Men universe. Uh, And that story was featured in Marvel's Voices, Indigenous Voices, a series that's getting a lot of attention right now. So how did that project come about? Uh, I did some comic work before this uh, with humanoids, but never worked with Marvel. Uh, However, I I did get a email, you know, inquiring whether I'd be interested in this project. And of course, before you sign a NDA, can't really know much details, but I I did have this call with the editor. And almost immediately, I I wrote this list of reasons why I should write Danny Moonstar, because I started really getting into X-Men in junior high. And she's really the one character who I think resonated with me strongly and, and has done so for almost, you know, two decades. So I, I said, you know, I, I really love to write Danny. And the editor was like, oh, of course. <laughs> so that, that's how I ended up doing this story. As a, as a fan of, of X-Men and this universe, it was so cool to contribute to, to her character and also to contribute a new Native mutant. Yeah, that is so cool. I want to say, you know, I don't want to kick up a DC Marvel uh, fight on our social medias or anything like that. But I was I was definitely a Marvel kid for sure. <laughs> so growing up, you were drawn to Danny Moonstar. Um, how did it feel to be able to write a story for her? Oh, oh boy, it was it was just uh, wonderful. And, and it's the first time I really contributed to a universe that had already been so deeply elaborated, you know, for 20 years. Uh, but fortunately, having that background and just being a huge X-Men fan really prepared me for that. Like, I, I know the history of Danny. I've been reading her stories since they came out, you know, first in the 80s, with the new mutants, all the way up to like 2020. I did also want to do the character right, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, because like, she, she's been so important to me. I felt almost this big responsibility to, you know, portray her in a way that you know, the fans of X-Men would enjoy. <laughs> yes, you have to please those fans. You you don't you want the fans on your side for something like this for sure. <laughs> oh, they've been great though. I, I say the the greatest feedback has been from people who enjoy X-Men. <laughs> oh, great. That's great. So, on the show today, we're asking indigenous writers what books they would recommend for our holiday book list. What book would you suggest people read? Oh, uh, so this is for fans of horror, for sure. Okay. Uh, If if you're not into horror, if you're not into scary, dark things, uh, don't don't read this. (laughs) But if you are, Stephen Graham Jones, The Only Good Indians, uh, just came out. And it's this really creepy story. Uh, I won't give too much away, but it involves scary elk, which I love. (laughs) Uh, So check that. And also his, his body of work in general. A lot of very nice, scary, like short stories, novellas, uh, novels uh, to explore. Great. Was there anything else about the book that you enjoyed besides the, without giving anything away? <laughs> a basketball. <laughs> oh, basketball. It's a, it's a theme in, in his work. Um, I also have to recommend another book by him. It's called Night of the Mannequins. 
Um, that one is, is on my TBR list, so I, I still need to get to it. But my friends really love how it has this very fun spirit of the classic slasher movies, uh, the writing. Uh, so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to check out. Uh, Stephen Graham Jones is a prolific writer. Uh, lots of short stories, you know, novellas, uh, novels. Uh, so if you're into horror, definitely look into those. <laughs> well, thank you for taking the time and chatting with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. It was so it was so much fun. Darcy Little Badger is Lippin Apache of Texas. Her debut, Alatsue, is a young adult fantasy novel which follows a young girl who can connect with the spirit of dead animals. That book was included in Time Magazine's list of 100 best fantasy novels of all time. If you want to see a list of all the books we featured on the show today, head to our website, cbc.ca slash unreserved. That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. If you want to get in touch with us and tell us about a book that you love, you can email us at unreserved at cbc.ca, or you can find us on Facebook or Twitter. This episode was produced by Stephanie Cram, Kyle Muzika, Zoe Tennant, Robin Summerfield, and Anna Lazowski. I'm Phelan Johnson. Now we'll go with for listening. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.